Well, good morning. I know. There's few in numbers today, but let's try that again. Good morning. Thank you. Let's get our hymnals out. 305, guys. Turn back a few. 135, guys. No. 
Is it on? Good morning. All right. I didn't see the little red dot because my thumb was covering it, so I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> Beautiful weather. That's on. It was rebellious. Whip that thing in the line. Ah. Uh, like I was saying, we got some beautiful weather outside. Beautiful. We were out the Paxton had a couple of flag football games yesterday. So we were out in the middle of it. And while the temperature seemed to be pretty good, that sun was oppressive. See what happens when you turn it in the right place? Now turn me down a little. Um, but anyway, I, I thank you all for coming out because it's sometimes it's hard to come to church on nice days because, you know, you're like, oh, i got to go enjoy this, especially when it's like, you know, unpredictable we don't know if we're gonna have nice days right now uh because of the rain and all that kind of stuff but uh there's always plenty of time to do everything we need to do or want to do after church amen so uh i thank you all for coming uh in a way of prayer request um some of you already know because uh julie was making the phone calls uh that my aunt kathy and uncle rob my mom and my uncle Mark all have COVID. And mom was at church last week, and so was Mark. Neither one of those, uh, mom didn't test positive till Thursday, and Mark didn't until uh, Friday. So, you know, there's, I, don't, I don't think there's any danger uh, to anybody that was, you know, here. My mom's not really a hugger anyway because of, she has asthma with like perfumes and stuff like that, so she tries to avoid that. Uh, so I think everything's fine in that regard. However, uh, Julie did make some phone calls to tell folks not to come to church today because uh, there was COVID, which, yeah, whatever. Um, but anyway, the other thing that's going on right now is allergies. That storm last night blew in everything that I'm allergic to. I'm not kidding. 
Uh, I mean, there was there was pollens of all sorts coming from Indiana and the West that flew in here. Grass pollen, uh, cottonwood, everything that I'm allergic to. Socialism, I mean, it was all just coming right out of the trees. I was sneezing my brains out. <laughs> but anyway, I'm just kidding about the socialism part. I, I, I'm not allergic to it, but I just hate it. Um, but anyway, I thank you all for being here today. We have a few announcements to get out of the way um, and let you know about. First thing is... Uh, I'm going to hand this off to Shay. This is the um, sign-up sheet for T-shirts. Um, this time we're doing gray T-shirts with the, uh, I don't know what even colors are. are it's like a lime green and sky blue, whatever it is, logo across the chest. Simple, plain, uh, nice T-shirts. But we're taking orders for those right now. F they're 15 bucks a piece. Um, if you go into the XLs, then you add, I think it's a dollar for every X, you know, so keep that in mind. Like for me, it's going to cost like $47, uh, for a shirt. But anyway, I'm going to hand this off to Shay. It's going to be in the back. We have to get the order in like this week. So make sure you sign up for that. I don't know. Okay. That's what that was. Yeah, I didn't know, but I just put it in the box. What is it? Yeah, you can. You can, but you don't have to have it today. Yeah, yeah. If you sign up, just make sure you put the money in. Um, it'll be good. Other In other wonderful news, uh, I should have a new roof this week, you know, so that's good. Uh, insurance company kind of had us over a barrel on something, you know, that it's supposed to be a $2,500 deductible on uh per occurrence for things that happen but there's a little clause in there that says except for wind and hail damage then it's five thousand and i read the policy and that's what it says so the policy is going to be changed or we're, or we're changing providers uh one or the other because i don't understand the the idea of writing a policy with a five thousand dollar deductible for a five thousand dollar roof doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me uh, so we're going to change that just so everybody knows uh, coming up. We're looking actively right now at other options for insurance coverage, um, which is a shame because they've been a pretty good company thus far. Um, anyway, Tuesday night we have a women's group, 630, meets here at the church in what we call the war room, which is back, uh, if you go to the water fountain in the bathrooms, it's over your right shoulder. There's a bunch of red couches in there. On Wednesday at 530 we have a planning meeting. Uh, for anybody who wants to plan, help plan the events in the church and stuff like that. Um, on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock is our men's group, also here at the church, also in the war room. Tonight at 6 o'clock we have our youth group that meets, so bring your kids tonight uh, for that. Uh, t this is the last week they're going to take a break for a few weeks um, for Josh and Nikki Patterson's uh, Bible study. So if you've been a part of that and want to be, uh, it's, it's this Thursday at 630 at 15 Bobtail Way in Monroe. So that's happening. Uh, May 29th, which is coming up, we're going to have a baby dedication service, which I don't even like it being called a baby dedication service. Really, it's a parents getting committed service. You know, that's, I mean, it's not for the babies, you know, it's for the parents to, you know, to commit to do what they're already supposed to be doing in the first place, which kind of makes the thing redundant, but whatever. Uh, it's happening after the, uh, not after the service. It's going to be during the service. Um, there's another announcement that's happening after the service and it got, you know, put together. So if you have a child that you would like to, you know, dedicate whatever, you, you know, be a part of the service that is four years old or younger, then you need to sign up on the sign up sheet back there. And the reason is that we are purchasing uh, gifts for the babies, you know, um, and, and this year I'll tell you what we're doing. It's, it's, we're buying them Bibles. <laughs> so you're like baby Bibles. Yeah, you can read even if they can't and you should be reading your kid the Bible anyway. Amen. Again, doing what you're supposed to be doing, but whatever, uh, immediately following that service, we're going to have a, uh, uh, heaven's kitchen is hosting a cookout because that's Memorial day weekend. So, um, is that Memorial Day? That's what happens at this time of the year, right? Okay. Labor Day is later on. 
All right. I get them confused. I apologize. I've only been doing it 42 years. Okay, so if you have T-shirt money, put it in a envelope, one of the envelopes, offering envelopes in front of you, write T-shirt money on it, put it in the plate when you leave today. Um, on June, it says June 1st. I don't think that's on the 1st. First Wednesday in June, we'll be having another gathering, whatever date that falls on. So uh, we'll do that. And today, we're going to partake in communion, um, one of the sacraments that, that uh, we do here. Uh, that and baptism, you know, two of the sacraments of the church that we ought to be uh, participating in on a regular basis. And um, the thing of it is that uh, when it comes to communion, um, people who have given their life to Jesus are the ones who are supposed to be taking part in, in communion, you know, with his uh, people, with his flock. So um, if you are, haven't given your life to Christ or, you know, whatever, don't waste your time, you know. That's, but that's between you and the Lord. Uh, we'll address that more on, later on. If you're missing a red cup, there was one left last week, and it looks a lot like this here because this is it. If this belongs to you, it was left in a pew. Is that you, buddy? All right. Good. I'm glad it found a home. It's funny, the stuff that uh, we do. Find. No, no problem at all. Um. There was also a gold ring found downstairs in one of the bathrooms. And uh, if you're missing a gold ring, come and describe it, and uh, we'll see if it's yours. All right? I think that's it. That's enough. Anybody else have anything? The creek baptism is happening uh, early next month, but we're not prepared to announce it yet because the date may change we're announcing it but the date may change all right it's all right you're good you're good it ain't your fault it's all good i think that's it right let's stand and worship together i'm better at preaching than i am announcements so if you're new here <laughs> Yeah, that's
you guys know this. Come on. Thank you.
right, guys, have a seat. Was grace that taught my heart to fear in grace my fears we
love that. Take time to answer them. Amen. Uh, if you have your Bibles, we're in Daniel chapter 4 today. And if you're new here or, or uh, visiting or, or just been here a while, you just don't have a Bible, uh, you'll find one in front of you. It's blue, and uh, we want that to be our gift to you. Um, if you're using that Bible, we're going to start on page 431 today. Um, there's also a welcome card there. And if you'd fill that out with as much information as you're comfortable with um, and stick it in the plate when you when you leave today, or you can give it, well, Missy's not at the back table. Shay probably will be by that point. But when you walk outside to the right, there's a welcome station there. And whoever's standing there, if you give that card to them, um, we have a gift just for you uh, choosing to worship with us today. But now that you all have Bibles, turn to Daniel chapter 4. And uh, we'll get started. Heavenly Father, we love you and I thank you for today. I thank you for your amazing grace that never ceases to amaze me. And Lord, actually, it's, it's an understatement to simply call it amazing, but that's, all, that's as far as the English language can, can take us. So Lord, uh, we thank you for that grace. We thank you for giving us your goodness that we don't deserve. We thank you for your mercy and not giving us what we do deserve. Lord, and uh, I, I thank you for being able to come under this roof in some air conditioning and uh, be able to gather with your people and read your word. Lord, I pray that in the reading of your word today that, Lord, we would all um, glean from it whatever it is that you would have for us. Lord, I pray that uh, your spirit would move in this place. I pray, Lord, that uh, you would tear down any barriers that we'd have uh, to righteousness in our own hearts and in our minds and that you would conform us to your likeness. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So um, today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read a large chunk of the text. And then we'll come back and we'll talk about it, if that's all right. If it's not all right, we're doing it anyway. Okay? Here it is. King Nebuchadnezzar, our old buddy. To all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. It has seemed good to me to show the signs, to show the signs and wonders that the Most High God has done for me. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion endure, endures from generation to generation. Now, before we move on, yeah, Nebuchadnezzar, we've heard it before. You know what I mean? You remember at the end of chapter 2, after Daniel interpreted his dream, he said something very similar to that, didn't he? Very similar, but not the same. We'll get to that in just a little bit. After uh, God delivered the young men from the fiery furnace, we talked about last week, chapter 3, we heard the same thing, didn't we? Right, same thing. But not quite the same. And we'll get into that in just a minute. But we get back to it. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house and prospering in my palace. I saw a dream that made me afraid. As I lay in bed, the fancies and the visions of my head alarmed me. So I made a decree that all the wise men of Babylon should be brought before me, that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. Then the magicians, the enchanters, the Chaldeans, and the astrologers came in. And I told them the dream, but they could not make known to me its interpretation. At last, Daniel came in before me. He who was named Belteshazzar, after the name of my God, and in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. Make a note of that. The holy gods. And I told him in the dream, I told him the dream saying, O oh, Belteshazzar, uh, chief of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you and that no mystery is too difficult for you, tell me the visions of my dream that I saw and their interpretation. The visions of my head as I lay in bed were these. I saw and behold a tree in the midst of the earth and its height was great. The tree grew and became strong, and its top reached to heaven. And it was visible 
to the end of the whole earth. Its leaves were beautiful and its fruit abundant, and in it was food for all. The beast of the field found shade under it, and the birds of the heavens lived in its branches, and all the flesh, all the flesh was fed from it. I saw in the visions of my head as I lay in bed, and behold, a watcher, a holy one, came down from heaven. He proclaimed aloud and said thus, Chop down the tree and lop off its branches. Strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the beasts flee from under it and the birds from under its branches, but leave the stump of its roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze amidst the tender grass of the field. Let him be wet with the dew of heaven. Let his portion be with the beasts in the grass of the earth. Let his mind be changed from a man's, and let a beast's mind be given to him. And let seven periods of time pass over him. The sentence is by the decree of the watchers, the decision by the word of the holy ones, to the end that the living may know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will and sets over it the lowliest of men. This dream, I, Nebuchadnezzar, easier said than done, I, King Nebuchadnezzar, saw, and you, O Belteshazzar, tell me the interpretation, because all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known to me the interpretation, but you are able, for the spirit of the holy gods is in you. Now, so Nebuchadnezzar, uh, just summary, has a dream. In that dream is this big, beautiful tree, biggest that anybody could possibly imagine. You can see it from all the earth. It's healthy. It's fruitful. It's uh, providing shade and nourishment for those, everybody that's under it, all that kind of stuff. And then a watcher comes from heaven, one of the holy ones, and says, cut it down, lop it off, cut off the branches, just leave the stump bound with an iron and uh, bronze band, right? And then it switches the terminology. It goes from talking about a tree and it to him. Right? And it says, let him be changed. Let his mind be changed. Let, let him lay in the, in the field like the beast and let dew get on him. You know, all this kind of stuff. And so I can imagine what this conversation was like for those who heard it. Because I'm going to tell you something. Anybody who, like, this isn't like one of those things that you have to, like, look at tea leaves and, and bones and stuff like that to figure out what's being said here. You know what I'm saying? When the enchanters and the Chaldeans and all them came in, they probably knew exactly what was going on because of the nature of the dream. But nobody had the guts to tell him, except Daniel. It could be the case that Daniel's the only one that knew. But even if they all knew, Daniel would be the only one that would have the guts to tell him because Daniel's the one that served God. And so Daniel says, I'll tell you the interpretation, but I wish it was for your enemies. You can read the rest if you, you know, don't take my word for it. He says, I I wish it was for your enemies, essentially. He's like, here's the interpretation of the dream. That tree is you, is your kingdom. God's made you powerful. He's made you mighty. He's made you fruitful. He's made you prosperous. There's a lot of people that are being taken care of under your empire, and that empire was the greatest that, that the world had seen to that point, literally. but it's going to be cut out from under you. You are going to be chopped down, and you're going to be made like the beast of the field. You are going to be humbled before God. But in verse, I think it's, uh, what is it, 37, 27? I think it's 27. The reason I'm not reading the interpretation because it, re- it just restates the dream, and you all just heard that. Amen? So in terms of, in time, for time's sake, that's the, uh, the reason that I um, skipped through it. But it says in uh, verse 27, after he's done telling him that this is all about him, so that he would know that heaven rules, it says in verse 27, Therefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable to you. And then listen to what he says. Break off your sins 
by practicing righteousness and your iniquities by showing mercy to the oppressed that there may perhaps be a lengthening of your prosperity. In other words, repent. You know what I mean? Like even, even to this moment, after all he has seen, he says, repent. And I'm going to tell you exactly what God does. Let's read it. It says, should look at my glasses on? Verse 28. All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. I knew it would. Daniel said it. Right? God showed him, and there it is. It all came upon him. Just like the dream said. Again. All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, and the king answered and said, Is not this great Babylon? Listen to this. Listen to the pride. Is not this great Babylon, which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty? While the words were still in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven. O King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you, and you shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling place shall be with the beasts of the fields, and you shall be made to eat grass like an ox. And seven periods of time shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. Immediately the word was fulfilled against Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from among men and ate grass like an ox, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair grew as long as eagle's feathers, and his nails were like bird's claws. Literally, God said it, it happened, amen? It's funny because it's like every time we read in the scriptures that God says something's going to happen, it happens. Crazy how that works, right? It's crazy how that works. And I'm going to tell you, when we talk about the end times, when God says this is going to happen, guess what? It's going to happen. But I'm going to tell you that it's easy to read this story with a finger pointing at Nebuchadnezzar. Because it seems like the story is just about Nebuchadnezzar. But I'm going to tell you something. It's not just about Nebuchadnezzar. It's not just about Nebuchadnezzar and his pride. It is a story of God's love. That's what it is. Because I want to tell you something. God loved Nebuchadnezzar. Amen? God loved Nebuchadnezzar. We see the evidence of his love throughout the entire book up to this point. We see the evidence of God's love in Nebuchadnezzar's life. God had made his kingdom the best, biggest, boldest, smartest, richest, healthiest kingdom on the face of planet earth. God made that. Nebuchadnezzar tried to take the credit, didn't he? But God did that. See, a lot of times God blesses folks to show his great love. Most of the time, when God blesses people, it's to show his great love. You know what I mean? Sometimes he blesses them by giving them bad things which is what we see at the end of it. Amen? But think about everything before that. God showed his love to Nebuchadnezzar. He expanded his power, allowed him to prosper. It became the mightiest empire on the face of the earth. And then God used him as a tool for his judgment. You guys remember that? I don't want that to get lost in translation here. God prophesied through two different prophets that the Babylonians, the Chaldeans were coming as an instrument of God's judgment against a, faith, uh, a faithless people, the Israelites. You guys remember that? God showed his love to Nebuchadnezzar by allowing him to take into captivity his own people. You're like, well, that's a sign that you could really miss. I agree. And God sent other signs like in the very first chapter of this book. God showed his love for Nebuchadnezzar by blessing 
Daniel, Shadrach, and Meshach, and Abednego. And their faithfulness to him, to, to, the, to the path that God laid out. They were faithful to that path. They did not eat the king's meat. You all remember? And then Nebuchadnezzar brings them in and talks to them. And I'm going to tell you that he elevated them to some of the highest positions that he could elevate Jewish boys. Right? That's a testimony. That's a testimony to Nebuchadnezzar the king. I'm going to tell you that if when God puts people in his life that he's blessing and they're doing something right and they're getting blessed, then that ought to send off some, some warning signs, a light bulb saying, you know, there may be something to this God. Right? But then in the second chapter we see that Daniel comes in. Nobody else in the whole kingdom could tell Nebuchadnezzar, number one, what his dream was, and two, the interpretation of it. Remember, he kept mum on the dream. He wasn't telling anybody about what the dream was. They had to tell him the dream and its interpretation. Right? And God shows up, shows his love to Nebuchadnezzar by blessing Daniel and giving him this miraculous interpretation and the dream. Because God loved Nebuchadnezzar. See, when we look at this, we, a lot of times we think, well, Nebuchadnezzar is just a tyrant. Yeah, he was. God loves tyrants too. You know what I'm saying? See, it's easy for us to look at Nebuchadnezzar and just write him off as a tyrant and forget the fact that he is an image bearer of God Almighty. Right? Right? And I'm going to tell you that Nebuchadnezzar several times was at a, at a point where he was balancing on the head of a needle. And though it looked that he was going to fall the right way, he fell the wrong way. After God gave Daniel that interpretation and that dream, Nebuchadnezzar, what did he say? He said, your God's the best God. Your God's the most powerful God. Long live forever, forever your God. You know, all this stuff. He made lip service. And I'm going to tell you, that there's a whole bunch of Christians that do the same thing today that call themselves Christians. What do we see? The very next thing that happened. The very next thing that happened, Nebuchadnezzar was like, yeah, that was cool and all, but I'm still the king, and my God is the one that we're going to worship, so I'm going to build a big statue. You remember that, chapter 3? I'm going to build a big statue, and when, I, when my band, when my worship band starts to play, then you got to hit your face before my statue of my God and worship my God. That's like the next thing that he does because of his pride. Probably had people in his ear, listen, you've elevated these Jews up to places that they're not supposed to be. You've made declarations about their God, but he's not the one that got us here. Look at, look at all these false gods that you've been worshiping up until now. That's how you got here. Make a declaration, O king. Make a declaration. Show the people that you're still in it to win. I'm telling you, i got friends like this. Anybody else? Make a declaration before the people. And he's like, oh, I'll do better than that. I'll make them all worship my God. So he builds the statue and says, if anybody doesn't hit their face, I'm going to put them in a fire. He does that to the three boys who refuse to hit their face, right? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And through Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, God showed his great love for Nebuchadnezzar by faithfully delivering those who were faithful to him. Another great testimony to Nebuchadnezzar because God loved Nebuchadnezzar. Amen? After witnessing that, chapter 4 just doesn't make sense to me. You know what I mean? Like, that's chapter 3. He, he sends boys into a fire that's designed to melt metal, heats it up seven times hotter, and then throws boys in that fire. And when he looks in to see if they're good and charred, there's four of them, and they're walking around. And one, and by his own lips, is like one of the, the sons of God, of the gods. Right? He sees it. And when they come out, the clothes that they wore in, 
didn't even have the smell of smoke. Their hair wasn't singed. I'm going to tell you something because, you know, there's all these like, if you turn on the History Channel, first of all, don't expect to get much history. I'm just going to let you all know. You get their interpretation of what they want you to believe about history. That's what you get. But you, should, you watch them, and they'll tell you things like, well, it could have been the case that inside of this furnace, because their technology wasn't like ours, there could have been a cold spot in which the boys stood while the, until the fire dissipated. And I'm like, you idiot. Did you not read the text? They said they didn't even smell like smoke. And while there may be a cold spot in a furnace, that cold spot's going to be a whole lot hotter than any of us can survive if it's made to melt metal and then heated seven times hotter. At the very least, you're going to smell like smoke. Amen? But God loved that Nebuchadnezzar, and he loved those boys. And he displayed his love for Nebuchadnezzar by showing his love for those boys. And that was a testimony. Afterwards, Nebuchadnezzar says, you know what? Your God, your God's the most powerful. Your God's the highest. May he live forever. Same thing he said in chapter 2, right? May he live forever. You know, that's the one we're all going to worship, you know. It's all good. If anybody, and then then he takes a step further. If anybody in any other nation or anything else says anything bad about their God, I'm going to tear them limb from limb. Right? Which is evidence that there wasn't any heart change. Right? Which makes chapter 4 make a little more sense. Then he goes back to his old gods and he's like, listen, I had this dream. It's an unsettling dream. I had an unsettling dream just last night. It was an unsettling dream. I'll share with you all about it because, you know, I tell you all things I shouldn't anyway. So my dream was, this is crazy. We were standing out on the porch and it was dark. And Paxton was popping off at the mouth, which occasionally he does. I know some of y'all are like, not Paxton. Paxton, right? And he's popping off at the mouth because I told him to do something or whatever. In my dream, he's even being rebellious, right? And he starts to walk off, and he goes over here by the church. And I was like, Paxton, get over here right now. You got four seconds. I don't know why four seconds. It's usually three, but in my dream, it's four. In my, in, even in my dream, if he, even though he's rebellious, I'm gracious. I gave him an extra second. I said, you got four seconds to get over here. And he's like, but, 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 and starts running his mouth right as I start counting. And then across the street, you know, from these woods over here, comes running this dude in black clothes. And he's running with the speed of an animal and growling and, and grunting like an animal. And he goes right for Paxton. And I start running to Paxton. He grabs Paxton, and somehow Paxton's freaked out, crying and everything, and he, he gets away and starts running toward the house, to me. He gets past me, and I tell him, I said, go inside, get my other gun, because I already have one. And I pull my gun out and try to shoot the guy, but I can't. It won't work. And then I wake up. Like, that was the dream. This was at 4.15 this morning. I know, because it woke me up. And I looked at the clock. And after I looked at the clock, I heard a little bit of movement in the living room. So I looked down the hallway, and in the living room, I see Paxton in my chair with his body facing my chair, and he's turned around, and he's looking at me. 4.15 this morning. So I was a little freaked out. I was a little disturbed about my dream. It was one of those dreams that I tried to fall asleep real quick so I could get back in and shoot the guy. (laughs) Anybody ever had a dream like that? You try to get back in real quick? Does it ever work? Sometimes. Sometimes you can get back in those. It's weird. But I, I, I'm not looking for an interpretation. You know, want to, you know, want to know why? Because I know why I had that dream. Two reasons. I had a meeting yesterday about helping a homeless feller that uh, is in Franklin. Right? And that's a little, a little Pentecostal back there. Doing a little shouting. No worries at all. I got six kids that don't bother me. I just keep preaching. Yeah. But anyway, so I had a dream about helping this guy and how to help him. And I didn't have a dream about that. I had a meeting about that. And that combined with my McDonald's, that's what happened. But what I'm saying is that I've had dreams that were unsettling, and I'm sure you have too. 
This one was so unsettling to him, and he's the king, he's got some power. So he calls in some folks. And you would think, after the series of events that he's gone through, the very first call that he would make would be to Daniel. So why in the world did he bring Daniel in last? Because he's still unconvinced. How in the world are you still not convinced? God has shown his love to you by making you powerful then showed that it wasn't you who made yourself powerful over and over again by doing things that you or your gods cannot do. And still he says, finally, I'm going to call Daniel because he's got the spirit of the little G gods. Right? Like my gods are working through him. No, dummy. You had it the first time right. His God is God. Amen? Amen? So, finally, Daniel comes in and still, still, even after being told by God's man, God's plan, he says, this is, this is Babylon. I did this. This is my hand. I say when it's over, essentially. I'm the one in charge here. And then God says, yeah, right, cow. Then he's a cow, <laughs> an ox, right? Literally what happened. So God showed his great love again to Nebuchadnezzar. He did so by delaying his humility and offering the, him the chance of repentance because God loved Nebuchadnezzar. Amen? He loved him. He loved him so much that even though he was stubborn in his pride, God loved him so much that he humbled him. He humbled him. He wouldn't do it on his own terms, so God did it on his. Amen? He, he wouldn't humble himself, so God did it for him. He took the mightiest man on the planet at that time and made it to where he absolutely and utterly lost his stinking mind. But I'll remind you that Nebuchadnezzar is the mightiest person in the world at that time. So just making him lose his mind, if he kept his power, would have been extremely dangerous. We've seen throughout history what happens when people who lose their mind have great power. It's a recipe for disaster. And calamity. So God didn't just make him lose his mind. He also made him lose his power. Amen? Ain't nobody going to listen to no ox. When you're reading this, you're like, hold on just a second. I've read stories about people getting turned into frogs and all that kind of stuff. Those are fairy tales. Well, this is the truth. I don't know if he was out there mooing, but I know he was eating grass. You know what I mean? I read a while back that the, uh, the word that it uses to describe him here is uh, a word where we get the, the word that, for werewolf, lichen. And I'm like, that seems werewolfish. But I've seen them werewolf movies. They don't eat grass. So... I don't, I'm not saying it was a werewolf. What I'm saying is he lost his mind. He lost his mind. God humbled the greatest, the most powerful man on the planet because he loved him. He loved him. And at the end, we see what Nebuchadnezzar says as a result of that. And I want you to read it. This is after he comes back. And it says, at the end of the days... This is verse uh, 34. I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my reason returned to me. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion. And his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. And he does according to his will 
among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay in his hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time, my reason returned to me, and for the glory of my kingdom, my majesty and splendor returned to me. My counselors and my Lord sought me, and I was established in my kingdom, and still more greatness was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, for all his works are right and his ways are just, and those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. Now, some people believe, I'm happy to, I happen to be one of them, that this is the evidence of Nebuchadnezzar's regeneration, that he had given up to the Lord. And I hope to see him in heaven one day. And when I do, I'm going to ask him. I've never met anybody else that was a cow. Tell me how that felt. You know what I mean? What were you thinking? What was going through your mind? But I hope to see him in heaven one day. He responded to God's humility properly, finally. He didn't come out the gates and say, look at what my gods did. Let's go bow down to my statue. Strike up the band. Let's do that all over again. He said, I'm going wor to worship and I'm going to praise the king of heaven. Singular. He didn't say the kings of heaven. Amen. There's one God, and there's none greater than him. I love this story because God loved Nebuchadnezzar so much. Somebody who was so prideful. And the reason that I do is because I see myself in Nebuchadnezzar a lot. You know what I mean? I would be stiff-necked like that. Given the same scenario, I would be stiff-necked just like that. My circumstances were different, but my response was the same to God for a long time. For a long time. And so when I read this book, it reminds me that God doesn't just love Nebuchadnezzar. God loves the world. God loves the world. He loves people. That's, that's who I'm talking about, in the world, right? What he doesn't love is this, the man-centered, Satan-driven system that we live in that we call the world. He doesn't love that, amen? But he loves those that he created in his image, and he loves them so much that he shows them his love over and over and over and over again. And if you watch how the world responds to that showing of, of his love, you'll see Nebuchadnezzar in all of it. This is what I'm talking about. God loved the world so much. He showed his love so much. I didn't look at my notes today. I probably should have. He loves the world so much, and he shows his love by blessing his people in this world. Did you know that when Christians, when Christ followers are blessed, true Christ followers, I'm not talking about people that, you know, just make a contribution to a church so they can write it off on their taxes for political purposes. I'm not talking about that stuff. I'm talking about true followers of Christ. When God blesses his followers, his people, his flock, his church, that is a testimony for all who are not of his church. To say, listen, God's doing something here. Like, that's, that's bigger than me. And it's a blessing to them because it shows them his great love for them. God shows his love to the world not only by blessing his people, but also delivering his people. Amen? And listen, there's a lot of times when we read stories, like I told you last week, like we could have been reading about that fiery furnace, and it could have ended. It could have, it could have said, it could have, that those boys went into the furnace and then went to heaven. They were still delivered, amen? But the amount of deliverance that we see that's different than that in the world is something that the world should not be able to deny but constantly does. There is nobody living in the United States of America that doesn't know somebody that is a follower of Jesus Christ who's been cured miraculously in some way. They've heard the stories. It's been all over this land for a long time. People are asking these things like, why is there no revival you know, happening in the United States? Why does it seem like it continues to slide? And I'm going to tell you why. Because we've gotten used to the miraculous. It's not even a miracle. We try to explain it now. 
Literally, I've been in the hospital where on one day, somebody was dead. I mean, they were calling in the family because they were dying. I came home, I told Ashley, in three days, within three days, she's going to be gone. Because I've been around a whole lot of dying people right before they go. That's like what I, that's one of the things I do. Amen? But I told that person that I was going to show up the next day at 12 o'clock to pray with them. I was a little late because I always am. Ended up being 1230. I should have just said that from the beginning and then told myself 12 o'clock, you know. But anyway, I showed up at 12 o'clock, and that person's not in the bed anymore, and I, I just assumed they passed because my faith was little. I'm just being honest. The cleaning lady happened to be in there. She's cleaning everything up, and I said, I said, what happened? Did she already pass? And she said, oh, no, honey. She's already been up on walk. She's, she's walking somewhere. She's already been up and around the church, the, the nurse's station and everything today. I was like, what? They're like, yeah. So she gets back from where she was. I said, what happened? She said, doctor can't explain it. I said, well, I can. And I should have before I even came up here. You know what I mean? God's going to deliver. That's what he does. That should be a testimony to at least to every single person in her family. But I'm here to tell you that not every person in her family has accepted Christ. And I'm like, why not? She was in the fire. God showed up with her in the midst of the fire and then walked out of her with it. And she didn't even have the sins clothes. She didn't have the smell of smoke, nothing on her in a day. And you ain't giving your life to Christ. You ain't falling on your knees. Oh, yeah, we love Jesus. We go to church a couple times a year. Okay, Nebuchadnezzar, it's time to sell out. You know what I mean? God shows his love to the world by delivering his people. He shows his constant love of this world, of the people of the world, by delaying, by delaying his judgment and their humiliation and by offering repentance and forgiveness through Christ Jesus. That's the ultimate expression of God's love. Sending his son to die for their sin, to pay for that sin so that they could be in relationship with God, so that they could experience the joy The love that would compel three boys to say, I'm not worshiping nothing else. You can throw me in the fire. The reason that happens is because of relationship, amen? It's because they knew, not that they thought, not that they'd studied a lot about it, they knew God. Do you understand that? They knew God. They had walked his, 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 his will in their own lives. They'd seen it. And God's going to show his love for the world by humbling it in his due time and everyone in it. You know what my Bible says? Every knee will bow. It doesn't say Everybody but that really rich dude. Amen? It doesn't say everybody but that one chick who was pretty famous on TikTok. It doesn't say everybody but that really smart guy that invented that one thing. It says every knee will bow. That's what it says. And that's going to happen. I'm going to tell you something else too. That God loves you. Amen? God loves you. He showed his love to you over and over and over again. He showed his love to you by literally having people placed in your life to follow him. And he shows up in their lives time and time again, and you've seen it. You've witnessed it. As a testimony to you because he loves you. God has shown his love to you by putting people in your life to follow him that he's delivered from some crazy stuff. You're like, well, I don't know anybody personally. Glad to meet you. 
Amen? Sit around, I'll give you my testimony. I gave it to somebody this week, and they're like, how in the world are you even still alive? I said, it's by the grace of God. It's nothing else. Like, when I say there is nothing good in me but Christ, I literally mean it. That's it. Because I've been through the furnaces. I've been pulled out. Amen? God has done that in my life as a testimony for yours. Amen? And if you follow Christ, you know exactly what I'm talking about because he's delivered you you from some stuff too in front of those who are around you because he loves them too. Amen? God has shown his great love for you. By put it, think about this. See, when I talk about, you know, God's put people in your life, people that love him, that follow him, that he's pulled out of the fire and things like that. I'm going to tell you somebody I think about immediately. When I was writing this down, I wasn't thinking about my, myself at all. I'm going to tell you, I was thinking about my granny. That's who I was thinking about. She was, she was, a, she was a pistol in a lot of ways. But I'm going to tell you, God had brought her through some stuff. You know what I mean? Delivered her. And it was because of that testimony of her faith that it, it kind of, the light kind of splashed on me. You know what I mean? Now, I want to be very clear. I'm not saying that because of her faith, I'm going to heaven. I'm saying that because of her faith, it was a testimony to me. And so when I was humbled, I knew where it came from. You know what I mean? That's what I'm saying. God's put people in our lives. I think about my girl. Maybe it's your granny. Maybe it's your parents. Maybe it's your, your uncle or somebody, a community leader that was really just a humble follower of Christ and you saw what God's done in their lives. God did that close to you in your proximity because he loves you as a testimony for you. God has shown his great love for you by delaying your humility too. By offering you the same thing that was offered to Nebuchadnezzar. Because humbling's coming. Humbling's coming. It's coming. The Bible says so. Right? When it says every knee will bow, every tongue can, can confess, it's your knees, your tongue. It will. Guaranteed. But he's delaying that because he loves you. And I'm going to tell you what he did because he loves you so much. He sent his own son to die for you, for your sin, to pay for your sin. That's what he did because he loves you so much. It offers you forgiveness. He offers you repentance through Jesus. That's how much God loves you. And he loves you so much that even if you don't accept it one day, you will be humbled. Well, how is it an act of love for God to humble me? How is that an act of love toward me? Because he's holy. Because he's sovereign. And it would not be an act of love to pretend as if you are. Amen? That would be a lie. And lies aren't love. Amen? So the question is, who are you going to be? How are you going to react? Are you going to be like Nebuchadnezzar? Make some false proclamations and then go back to your old gods? Is that what you're going to be? You're going to be the professing Christian? The one who comes in and talks about Jesus and everything, but then go lives their w wicked lifestyle? The one that totally and absolutely rejects repentance because, you know, you're so cool that you're the one who gets off without having to do it? Are we going to be the ones with the stiff neck that says, even in the midst of all that love that God has shown us over and over and over again, look at what I've done, look at what I've created, I'm mighty, I decide when this thing ends? Or are you going to be the one that says, listen, his kingdom reigns forever. 
I am nothing, and neither is anyone else. He does as he wills. So I'm going to praise him. Which Nebuchadnezzar are you going to be? That's up to you. But I'm going to tell you something. I pray that God don't have to deal with you like he did Nebuchadnezzar. Turn you into a cow out there eating grass and all that kind of stuff. But I'm going to tell you something right now. We don't really have a running lawnmower. So if any of your friends start to be Nebuchadnezzar-like, bring them on out. We got tons of grass. Who are you going to be? Who are you going to worship? Are you going to continue to worship yourself? Or are you going to give God his due? The sovereign creator of us all who loves us so much that he blesses those around us who follow him. He delivers them. He delays our own humility, offers us forgiveness of our sin and repentance to turn away from it. And Christ, his own son, would you give him your life today? Would you humble yourself today? Would you humble yourself? Listen, would you humble yourself today? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this story. I thank you for Nebuchadnezzar and for the testimony, that thread that runs through this of your sovereignty. You are sovereign. And Nebuchadnezzar thought, just like I did just like everyone who's in this room for a while, that we were, the, we were the rulers. We were the ones in control of our own destiny. We were the ones that controlled our lives. Lord, there are many of us here who have said and, we, we, and, and shown that uh, we know better, that it's you, it's all you. You, and there's none beside you. Lord, there's some folks here that are still struggling for your throne that are trying to stiff, you know, be stiff-necked and you know, not repent of their sins and go back to the same old stuff. They come to church every now and again check off that box. But surrender is absent in their lives. Lord, I pray that they would be humbled before you. And if they refuse to humble themselves, Lord, I pray that you humble them because of your great love, because there is none beside you. Lord, I thank you for you. How you love us so much. And we don't deserve it. A stiff-necked people who deserves bondage, you offer freedom in Christ. Lord, I pray that we would all accept it. I pray, Lord, that we would also understand that when we're blessed when we're delivered, it's not just so that we can say, hey, we're blessed and delivered. It's so that we can tell everybody else, we can show everybody, show the world, that we can splash that light on some other folks and give you glory and honor and praise because you did it as a testimony for those who are around us. And Lord, I pray that we would understand that even if everything's dead all around us, if you're in us, we're alive in you. And Lord, you offer that life to all of us because you love each of us. I thank you for that. I thank you for that assurance today. I thank you for Nebuchadnezzar we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing.
cannot stand out from you. Jesus, you're my hope. 